all of you, and thank you for choosing ICTF as your Educational and Professional Development Association. My name is Beth, and I will be the moderator for today's webcast. Please note that today's webcast is being recorded, and all participant lines will be muted during this call. If you need technical assistance at any time, please email us at info at ictfworld.org. The PowerPoint presentation was emailed to all participants earlier today in case you need it for future reference. Today's presentation will last 60 minutes and includes a question and answer period at the end. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker. David Irwin is Associate Director with Bureau Van Dyke. David is part of Bureau Van Dyke's global product group for credit using ongoing market feedback from around the world to anticipate the needs of the modern credit risk function. He has specific experience working with multinational organizations to optimize and streamline their credit risk assessment and management processes, and is a regular participant in forums on global credit, data governance, and risk management. David, welcome to the program. Let's get started. Perfect. Yeah, thank you, Beth, and, uh, and, and thank you, everyone, for, uh, for the time today. Yeah, definitely looking forward to spending the, the next hour together. Um, before we jump into the, the topic at hand, I guess the, the one other um, introductory note I would make is, is for those who are uh, maybe less familiar with, with Bureau Van Dyke. Um, we are a, um, a subsidiary of, of Moody's Analytics as of the, the end of 2017. So we essentially act as the, the data arm of, of Moody's where we specialize in the, in the provision of private company and, and public company data. Um, and, and, and integrating that into our client's workflow to, to drive better, you know, more automated and informed decisions across um, multiple sectors, whether that's corporates where I have a lot of my specialty or financial institutions or governments or, or academic institutions, um, as well as various functions, obviously credit, as we're going to talk about today, but also uh, legal and compliance, uh, supplier risk, master data, sales and marketing, the like. Um, so yeah, so jumping into kind of what we're going to be covering today, um, obviously the, the, the topic at hand is, is kind of the challenge of, of mitigating risk while also uh, enabling business growth, right, which is very much a, a core challenge for, you know, essentially every credit department in the world. Uh, and so the way I'd like to, to, to address uh, and, and handle our time today is to spend kind of 30 to 40 minutes on, on the first three uh, bullet points here, you know, kind of first uh, outlining and, and defining, you know, really what this, what, you know, why this is a challenge and, and, and what contributes to uh, the difficulty and in, in oftentimes, you know, kind of balancing these two potentially conflicting ideas, um, as well as then propose um, a, a couple different solutions. Um, you know, the first, you know, uh, you know, what internal factors can be, can be changed or modified to, to potentially contribute to uh, a better risk first balance uh, or a you know, risk first growth balance uh, and then the second you know kind of looking externally to say okay from a from an information perspective from a, a you know external data gathering perspective you know what can be changed to to, to similarly um, improve a, a company's ability to to find the, the right you know balance of enabling sales while uh, not taking on an, an overly risky profile right um, we'll then kind of conclude and, and I'll give everyone a few kind of summary points uh, to take away uh, and then that'll lead us into our kind of Q&A session um, for, the, um, uh, for the day. Um, I guess a, a, just a kind of housekeeping note on that. Uh, as we go, um, please do feel free to put questions into the, the chat box on the side. Um, I'm, I will, I'll sort of wait to answer all of them till the end. but. Um, you know, as things kind of pop into your mind, go ahead and, and start putting those in. So we'll have kind of a bit of a, a, a queue lined up um, for the last 15 or 20 minutes that we can spend on the Q&A. Um, and then just for everyone's reference, if you need any additional information on Bureau Van Dyke, I did a, include a few slides at the very, very end just for your reference that, that we will cover in, in today's session. Okay, so um, let's talk about the challenge first and foremost. Well, I guess the question is, you know, what do we mean when we, we talk about the challenge of, of balancing risk and growth? Um, well, obviously, companies are, are, you know, always under pressure to grow, to maximize shareholder value, 
Um, and, and the reality is, you know, the, that growth often needs to come from new developing markets where you know, the reality is there's, there's less information available in many cases to make a, a clear risk decision, right? Um, and at the same time, companies, you know, while they're under pressure to grow into those markets, they're also under pressure to avoid doing business with risky organizations, whether that's from a, a financial risk perspective or, you know, a regulatory compliance risk perspective. Um, and it's not like companies can just avoid working with these markets or working, you know, with these companies altogether uh, as the, you know, the, the, the growth potential is, is significantly higher in, in emerging economies than, than developed markets. Um, and as you know, sales and credit are not always working hand in hand, although I think in many cases uh, you know, that's something that the companies would, would like to see more of, you, know, you can kind of easily see how there would be a tension between sales and credit professionals. And, and so the kind of question becomes how do companies not only get this balance right on a one-off basis, but how do they, how do, they do that consistently across, across geographies, across business units, et, et cetera, right? So I think this is where, you know, I kind of want to propose this idea of, you know, it's a combination of both internal and external factors. Um, and, and, and that's where businesses are, are potentially finding solutions, you know, using a combination of reorganization, education, technology, sharing resources, you know, where we're rigorously applying data and, and the like, right? So to talk more specifically about some of those, those internal factors, um, Obviously, the, the role of a, of a modern credit manager has, has become you know, quite demanding uh, you know, in response to increasing expectations around risk oversight, around transparency. Um, it's essentially expected that, that the modern credit manager is going to argue and, and challenge decisions within the business uh, in order to sort of represent the, the risk half of the, the risk versus growth equation, right? Um, similarly, those credit managers are expected to evolve with, you know, changing regulations, new technology, competitive pressures to kind of continuously protect, but also adjust, you know, the company's risk profile. Um, and this is getting, you know, even more complicated in recent years with attention around uh, know your customer, you know, KYC, regulatory standards, sanctions, et, et cetera, um, that both the boardroom and, and regulators in the US, Europe, you know, large parts of Asia um, are, are you know, consistently uh, paying more and more attention to to try and involve, uh, evolve and improve transparency standards, right? Um, and all the while, credit you know, you know, really needs to be helping um, sales, right? They need to be acting as, as sales enablers within the business to you know, enable the business to reach its growth goals, um, yeah, and, and I think what we found is, is that becomes very difficult, if not impossible, to do if credit and compliance are you know, kind of ancillary to the business, if they're if they're treated as as separate and, and someone to be brought in at, at the last second, right? So I think that's that's you know, kind of what we want to look at here with a with a um, case study from from Pia Pavari and, and UPM, which is a a Finnish um, forest industry company, um, where they actually previously, op you know, I shouldn't say previously, they do operate across six different business groups. And, and what um, Pia has had found was that kind of each of those business groups traditionally has had its own P&L strategy. And so, you know, as the director of credit collections, she's not just dealing with, you know, one approach to credit risk, but, you know, many approaches, you know, across the, across the business, right? So I think kind of what we're seeing is, is in working with, with Pia and UPM is that, you know, kind of one of the first places to start in terms of trying to address, okay, how do we get a better handle on risk across the business and where we can, you know, appropriately grow versus where do we need to be more conservative uh, is that there needed to be a more holistic approach, you know, uh, internally to say, okay, it's, you know, it's about having a, a global view on, on credit and, and sales um, and, and having, you know, the kind of the two approached more holistically within, within the business, right? So that's kind of what I want to look at here with, with our first case study. Um, essentially what UPM did was, was kind of move from, you know, those kind of six disparate approaches um, to a, a single approach, uh, a single standardized process that could be designed, you know, specifically with that balance of uh, minimizing risk and maximizing growth 
uh, in mind, right? So this is very much a, a, a dramatic shift in terms of you know, using um, Credit Catalyst, which is which is one of DBD's tools, and, and SAP jointly to to kind of integrate the important parts of the business and, and build out user portals and reports, you know, designed for specific tasks that could be shared across kind of all of the various stakeholders in this, um, you know, in the, in the sales and credit and, and managing management reporting world, right? So kind of fundamentally implied here is this all sits on top of a, a common kind of shared warehouse of data, um, you know, which is made possible by, you know, kind of improving that, that underlying data quality um, but also then, you know, kind of getting everyone on the same page in terms of what are the things we care about tracking, how are we going to track them, you know, et cetera, right? And, and the results in terms of what UPM found was that, you know, they were actually really able to improve their, their interactions with both new and, and existing customers. Um, for existing customers, they were essentially using um, BBB and, and, and SAP's, you know, kind of combined automation capabilities to develop a scorecard that blends BBD's external company data with UPM's internal data that they had held on, you know, uh, AR, past customer experiences, the like, in order to segment their global customer base uh, and ultimately provide transparency to sales about things like um, companies that had reliably paid on time versus those that didn't, you know, a standardized, you know, kind of UPM risk score and, and credit limit calculation. Um, giving sales transparency down to the to the invoice level, uh, and even things like estimating the, the customer's ability to grow in the future, right? And so kind of this trickled over into the new customer side, where you know having increased transparency really helped the sales team prioritize their time, uh, as as credit could could start kind of proactively helping sales by outlining, okay, here you know different buckets of prospects, those that are attractive and should be prospected and are, you know, kind of pre-approved, those that should be, you know, avoided, um, kind of with the, the end goal of, of driving activity based on, on data, um, you know, based on, on hard facts rather than the you know, individual preferences or, or biases of the salespeople, right? And I think what we, what we found in, in, in what we've received in terms of feedback from, from PIA and, and the UPM team is that, you know, having this information and, and this visibility across the organization that, that everyone could sort of be um, singing from the same hymn sheet, so to speak, uh, really did drive a change in, in behavior uh, across the company as, you know, sales and, and management could essentially track over time, you know, deteriorations or improvements in the customer base, um, which in turn you know, motivated them to, to manage the customer better and, and, and to proactively uh, approach their customer relationships, right? So, um, you know, in general, that, that puts them in a position where um, you know, sales and, and credit are more closely aligned. Sales is you know, really at the center of the organization and, and isn't just being brought in at the end as, uh, as sort of a, someone to, to hopefully rubber stamp the deal and not get in the way. Um, so I think that puts them in a position then, you know, where they are working closely together, they're, they're collaborating to, um, to, to kind of, to be able to, to work together to determine, okay, where can we, where can we take risks, where, you know, where can we really grow, what are the areas where we're, you know, we're, we're not in a position to do that, right? And that had a, you know, kind of a, a knock-on effect once they were all on the same page that they were able to start you know, automating more of their processes, the, kind of the, the second piece of this case study um, that I wanted to talk about. You know, kind of one of the big areas there is uh, looking at the, uh, the credit limit process, right? So kind of the, the old way, which is probably very traditional and it'll, it'll sound familiar to a lot of you, is essentially UPM would just block an order if a customer exceeded its credit limit, uh, and then the credit controller would kind of reactively go in review the details, hopefully increase the limit to release the order, um, and then the, you know, the process could continue. Um, but the reality of that was, you know, it's obviously inefficient. It obviously has a, a negative impact on the business in terms of, um, you know, prolonging the sales process, um, you know, which has an impact on cash flow, et cetera. Uh, and so what, you know, 
Nokia and UPM and the, and the credit team, you know, decided to do was try and improve, you know, how, how efficiently they handled, you know, credit limits and, and, and see how much they could reduce their, you know, their business impact in terms of causing a, a stoppage in the sales process uh, by automating this, right? So, uh, for basically, the, the, the rule set that they came up with was to say, okay, when a customer's balance exceeds 80% of its, you know, kind of custom UPM calculated credit limit, then the credit controller is, is proactively going in to understand, you know, what has caused that increase in, in use of credit, you know, how that correlates, you know, with their sales, et cetera. And where possible, the credit controller carries out a risk assessment to, to try and increase that, that credit limit proactively, right? To kind of put um, sales and credit in line that, you know, whenever possible, they, you know, are, are not putting themselves in a position where they're going to have to halt the sales process to, to re-review the credit limit, right? So give themselves that, that cushion uh, and, and therefore not hamper business growth unnecessarily, which then has the, the effect for sales where, you know, credit is no longer seen as a kind of uh, a hoop to jump through or, or a potential blocker to a deal, right? Because they're not, they know that if there is something being, you know, kind of flagged that's pausing the deal, you know, there's a real concern driving that as opposed to, oh, this is, you know, bureaucracy and red tape stopping us. So I think that that also, again, kind of helps helps find that right balance between growth and risk because, you know, there's, there's more open lines of communication, a better understanding of how the, how the system works. Um, a couple other of the, the processes that got automated that are maybe worth just touching on as food for thought uh, in the future. I mean, one of them was was customer data collection. So, um, you know, the fact that sales or the, the customers themselves could upload, you know, financial and other information to a secure portal, which would then feed into um, the, you know, the, the customer risk models that are that are processing in the back end, which obviously cuts down on manual processing effort and saves time, but it also allows those companies to be assessed the same way as any other and, and kind of stay in line with the, the new standardized approach to, to balancing risk and growth, right? Um, another area that, um, that they went on to automate was just the credit assessment process itself, you know, which is kind of suggested here. Um, or implied here, I should say, it, it, you know, essentially they were able to build out an internal scorecard and model, you know, in conjunction with, with BVD's data so that all the companies um, that they potentially work with are scored automatically. So obviously that eliminates the need to manually type in information into the models to, to produce that, that credit score and limit, but it also puts them in a position that where they're leveraging external data um, they're not just limited to saying, well, we only really have um, information on our current customers, right? It actually lets them do some of that proactive prospecting that we talked about um, in terms of identifying potential companies that, you know, would be ideal to prospect that, you know, kind of fit their, their best case scenario and, and have the, the financial profile that, um, you know, would fit with, you know, where UPM feels comfortable in terms of, um, you know, growing and accepting risk. The final piece that, that I just mentioned there from a workflow automation was around building out approvals. So uh, based on, you know, a company's risk profile or credit limit or country or business unit or whatever the case may be, you know, UPM would, would set up specific approvals so that um, the decision would be kind of routed to the relevant manager, you know, pending approvals could be, could be tracked and be very transparent. And essentially take what was a, you know, oftentimes um, complex and, uh, you know, uh, overly tedious, you know, email back and forth process and turn it into something that's, that's easy to manage and, and, and automate. Right? So that touches on a, on a few of the kind of internal factors and, and some of the things that you know, we've found that trying to get better aligned on can help um, make managing you know, the decision of, you know, how much risk we're willing to accept, you know, without, you know, in inhibiting our, our ability to grow. I think what sort of fundamentally um, underpins that, which I think many of you would, would agree, is having the right information to actually drive that, um, regardless of, 
industry, regardless of geography, um, you know, having the right data to support a, a standardized global process. So that's kind of the, the, other, the other portion that I want to talk about next. Okay. I think what I've often found is that while companies would obviously like to be more aggressive in many cases in their credit approach, uh, particularly within you know certain markets, emerging markets, um, it's really a lack of information to, to back up the credit decision that that leads to a, an inherently more conservative approach. Right? It's not that they uh, don't want to grow in those markets, but it's the the inability to say, okay, yes, we're we're comfortable, you know, giving this size credit line to this company in this market, um, that that leads to to a conservative approach, right? So, to the extent that companies can improve their ability to to gather that information, uh, and particularly gather it in a efficient way, you know, given that there there's limited time in the day, and, and, and many companies, you know, have lots of customers to, to serve, um, you know, th those companies are going to be better positioned to, to optimize their, their risk profile in the, in the market, um, which I think is exactly what, you know, what Ryan, my, my colleague, is, is referring to here with, with this quote. Okay. So that's not to say that, that doing that is, is easy, right? There are some inherent challenges in obtaining that data, um, in understanding where that data comes from, you know, the like. Um, you know, I referenced earlier, you know, one of the major topics in the credit world today is, is, is how to enter a new market, particularly, you know, markets like Africa, Asia, Latin America, um, you know, which is, which is a big deal, you know, because I think, um, you know, the, the reality is, you know, as, as kind of the World Bank has reported, the, the collected GDP of those emerging markets are, are expected to grow by about double what the GDPs of, of more developed economies will, right? But, those emerging markets are also where, you know, back, you know, obtaining reliable information can be the most difficult, right? There's no international standard for, for company information. Uh, each country's culture around, around disclosure, around information is, is, is very different, right? So, you know, while in Europe you, you know, would expect that um, companies are oftentimes, you know, publishing, you know, and, and filing their information with, like, company's house in the UK or, or other local registry or, or, or tax authorities, um, you know, and, and to a certain extent that, that also exists in Asia, parts of Asia Pacific, you know, the reality in, is that, you know, in Africa, in Latin America, you, heck, even in the U.S., um, you know, that information isn't, isn't publicly disclosed in the same way, right? And, and even where that information is accessible, the the reporting formats, the financial standards, the you know the, the way that that data can be obtained, you know, will vary widely, which obviously makes it difficult to compare um, financial perform performance, to compare risk, um, you know, across borders, right? So, I guess then the question becomes, well, what can be done? How do you drive a you know a, a global um, the global process if, if, if data is so difficult there. Um, yeah, I think what we found at, at BBD you know, realistically is, is that there isn't a one-size-fits-all solution where you can just say, here's what you do in every country and it all works out the best, right? Um, you essentially need to go country by country to understand what, client, what companies are required to file you know, who they file it with, to what extent that is publicly disclosed, you know, how frequently that data is available, what it takes to obtain that data, you know, all of these things um, that, you know, realistically, I wouldn't expect a, a credit department to go have to develop independently, right? And that's kind of the, the foundation of, of what Bureau of Endike's done over the last 30 years is, is develop that expertise um, in, in terms of you know, who to partner with locally to obtain that data, as well as then partner, you know, develop the expertise around linking those disparate data sources, standardizing that, that data so that it's, it's easily comparable across borders, and then coming up with a methodology to actually um, assess the, the information available from that market, right? Because the reality is um, the same information is not available in, in every country in the world, right? 
in some countries, you will be able to obtain for private companies um, you know, full financial statements, right? And in those cases, you want to make a, an assessment of a company's credit worthiness based on you know, quantitative analysis of, of, their, of their financial performance. Um, in other markets where those financials aren't available, um, you, you need to assess you know, their financial strength kind of via proxy of saying, okay, what do we know about who they're owned by? What do we know about who their directors and managers are? What do we know about how long they've been in business? Do we have any financial information at all, you know, even if it's only partial, and kind of use that to assess financial strength. And then obviously in, in North America, you know, even though there aren't financials available, we've, we've done a lot in terms of um, working with trade payment data as a, as a, a, a risk, risk measuring metric, right? And so I think then the, the, the trick comes in working to, to, to basically capitalize on the best information possible in each country, in each jurisdiction, um, and having that appropriately blended to reflect um, your company's perception of risk, you know, your level of, of, of you know, aggression or, 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 or how conservative you want to be uh, in terms of, of growing and, and, and avoiding risk, right? So um, that's probably its all, whole own webinar in terms of, of how to do that and, and certainly may be a, uh, a topic of discussion, you know, offline, but, but certainly I think that's, um, you know, something that can be done, but um, something that needs to be done kind of on a, on a tailored basis. There's, like I said, there's not a one-size-fits-all approach to say this is, um, you know, the, the one way to assess risk worldwide. But I think if you, if you put the appropriate thought into how you design that, that risk assessment, you can end up with a, with a standardized approach, which can then drive and enable some of those kind of internal changes that we, that we just talked about. Right. Um, the other kind of piece of data, obviously, this focuses more on financial risk assessment, but probably what I've found to be one of the most valuable yet underutilized pieces of information um, in terms of, of driving the, the kind of risk versus growth um, decision and, and managing that tension is around um, corporate ownership data. And so, what I wanted to do was just kind of quickly talk through um, three potential use cases for that data, not to say that there aren't more, um, but um, to kind of plant ideas, hopefully, in, in your head as to how you might, you know, better utilize some of that and, and, and what's possible using ownership data, right? So the, the first and kind of most obvious reason to use ownership data is it, it does expand the kind of network of access to financial statements, um, uh, for a given customer, right? The, the reality is, is that, uh, you know, as globalization continues, more and more companies have complex ownership hierarchies that cross borders in order to, you know, whether it's in order to take advantage of tax breaks or, you know, to offshore or, or nearshore operations. Um, and all of those kind of different legal entities in different jurisdictions give us additional opportunities to gather information, to piece together um, you know, a, a company's risk profile um, because, you know, a, uh, a customer in South Africa may not disclose its financial statement, but if it has a, you know, a parent company in France or a, um, a subsidiary in Southeast Asia, you know, those, those jurisdictions, you know, do have a better chance of, of obtaining that data, and that can give you an insight into that company's financial stability or, or vice versa, right? So I think that's, that's a big thing to think about and a big thing to build in when you start talking about the global approach to, you know, managing risk and, 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 and kind of standardizing, um, you know, your company's risk profile um, is, is how the, you know, the complexity of, of corporate ownership trees can, can impact that and open up new doors for, for assessing risk, right? Uh, the kind of second use case that I, obviously I think a lot of people will have, have worked towards um, is taking that ownership data and blending it with your, you know, internal you know, AR data to do exposure analysis across the corporate group, right? Um, this isn't a new idea, but I think the, the point being here is that 
what I've found is that many, many credit departments spend uh, many, many hours trying to piece this puzzle together, right, and trying to compile these reports on a, you know, on a regular basis. And not only does having that kind of global standardized data enable you to automate that, but it also gives you a much probably more complete picture of a company's um, corporate group to, to, to kind of roll up. You know, I think one of the things that's um, obvious but sometimes difficult to accom uh, accommodate for is the fact that a subsidiary is not always going to have the same, you know, naming conventions and naming structure as the parent company, right? And so what I did here just in this, um, this example was take um, some corporate ownership groups from um, our global database, Orbis, um, and, and in the left-hand column, kind of change the, the GUO, the global ultimate owner name, to, to, to some generic names, and then show the ledger accounts, show how many subsidiaries there are in that corporate group, and then just give some examples of, of you know, how this, um, how this can be you know, utilized. You know, on the one hand, you have situations like Anonymous Corp here, the second line, where you've got an exposure across the corporate group that's that's greater than you know the the, the total credit credit limit that would be recommended, right? So it's where you find that you have you know, more risk, more exposure than than would be ideal, and, and you maybe need to you know to to look at ways to um, to reduce reduce that across the, the parent company and all of its subsidiaries. While on the flip side, you have you know examples like the blank group in that you know, second to bottom line where they're only using what about eight percent of their you know global ultimate owners you know kind of corporate group credit limit and that may be a good place to point sales to say hey there's an opportunity here for for growth and, and for us to do a lot more business with this company right um, so I think that sort of analysis it also can can point you know the company can point credit in the in the direction of okay where can we be enablers versus where do we need to to have a better handle on risk And then the kind of the third way that I've often seen ownership applied, and, and this is particularly relevant, you know, in more recent years, is using ownership to better mitigate the risk of doing business with an entity that is sanctioned or with an entity that is what we call sanctioned by extension, right? So um, the Office of Foreign Asset Control, um, OFAC, uh, is the entity that administers U.S. sanctions. And essentially what they... Um, have since 2014, I believe, uh, is, is a rule that's, that's called the 50% rule. And basically what that means is that you can't, not only can you not trade with a sanctioned entity, but you can't trade with any entity that is owned 50% or greater by that company, you know, kind of all the way down the, the corporate chain, right? So the idea here being that uh, OFAC doesn't want to put a Russian oligarch on its sanctions list and say you can't do business with this company, and then that Russian oligarch just goes and sets up a subsidiary in another country and does all of its business through that subsidiary, right? And rather than trying to play whack-a-mole to say, oh, now that company is sanctioned, now that company is sanctioned, OFAC has just put this 50% rule that says, okay, anybody 50% or owned or greater, you know, uh, whether directly or indirectly, um, is also sanctioned, right? So what I went in and did is just pulled an example here of, um, an SDN, a specially designated national uh, sanctioned individual in Russia um, here at the top, and then showed how 10 layers below, kind of you can see spider webbing all across the world, you know, we end up with a registered operating company in the U.S. Uh, that, is, that is owned by that, that Russian sanctioned individual. And so the reality is, is that this U.S. company and all of the other 10 companies in this chain won't show up on a sanctions list, but um, you, you certainly could be fined for, for trading with them, right? So to the extent that that's, you know, built into your, um, your credit process proactively to identify those companies and, uh, and drive, you know, sales kind of away from them and, and to someone else, you know, it stops um, sales from being a, you know, kind of, or stops credit from being a blocker right at the end and, and can, can enable you to kind of pro, pro, proactively manage um, you know, your, your sales organization, right? This was a really big deal back in, in April of, of last year because uh, OFAC added 12 Russian oligarchs to its um, 
sanctions list for allegedly interfering with the, the U.S. election. Um, and what we found that the day that that happened was that there were 1,300 companies um, identified in, in, in our global database that immediately became sanctioned by extension um, just from those 12 individuals, right, from their, their ownership chains. Uh, and 90% of those were, were registered outside of the U.S. Um, so, yeah, it, it is, it's a serious challenge and, and something that I think the modern credit and, and compliance organization is, is building proactively into their process. Okay. So before we kind of move on to the um, conclusion, I did just want to kind of pause, give you a sense of kind of the scale of, of this information, the scale of the challenge. I, I kind of put together some stats on, on Orbis, our, our global data set. Um, and I'm going to use this moment to pause, take a drink of water, and, and I would also say that if anybody has questions at this point um, that they want to go ahead and submit in the chat box, you know, please please go ahead and do so, and we'll we'll then kind of move on to the conclusion and, and Q and A section. All right, perfect. So uh, let's let's kind of talk takeaways here. Um, so kind of six points that I, I put together. Um, I think the, the first and, and most obvious is that, you know, to the extent that organizations can master both these internal structural factors that we're talking about and the external data gathering challenges, um, you know, they're going to be in a position to extend more credit, you know, to, and to do so, you know, without taking on undue risk um, that com and companies that, that don't, right? This is a, um, definitely an opportunity to to maximize the performance of the company um, you know, while while minimizing the, the risk right? um, and, and obviously you know, having um, a holistic view of credit having access to the best available information puts credit in a position to be you know a sales enabler rather than, than an impediment right um, and, and I think kind of moving forward you know even though there are challenges with regulations, expectations, et, et cetera, you know, the reality is companies have more and more information and more and more technology to help, you know, get this, this balance right. And the, because of that, companies are going to compete, you know, increasingly on their ability to choose the, the optimal balance, um, not just, you know, you know, making a, a, a decision at all, right? So I think that's going to be a, an, an interesting kind of trend to, to watch going forward. Um, and, and, you know, finally, in conclusion, I think we don't want to dismiss the fact that, you know, legacy technology, these fragmented business practices, et cetera, are all going to, you know, continue to, to test companies. Um, but the reality is, is, is despite all that, you know, the company's ability to use information, you know, make informed decisions, you know, access more data, um, you know, is, is only going to increase as, you know, the economy becomes more globalized, you know, better technology is implemented around the world. So, you know, the good news is, is that you know, companies can definitely look forward, I think, to increased efficiency, better decision-making, growth, et cetera, right? Um, but, you know, I think the, the argument here is that the, the best companies are going to be those that not only do that, but, you know, place credit, you know, more at the heart of their business, get more in line with, with sales and, uh, and the growth organization, you know, to gain better visibility into risk and, you know, ultimately utilize, you know, you know, more powerful, you know, globally comparable information in a, in a collaborative way. Okay. So before we move on to the Q&A session, just kind of one quick note. Um, first, we, we did publish a, a whole white paper on this topic, um, which is free, and, and I would encourage, you know, anyone kind of interested in this to, uh, to go download that, there's there's you know, uh, a lot more information uh, available there. Um, and also, if anyone has questions that are maybe more detailed or, or confidential, um, please do feel free to to get in touch with me. Uh, provided my email here, David Irwin at bvdinfo dot com, um, would would be happy to to discuss. Okay. So uh, right on schedule, we've got about 20 minutes left for Q and A. Um, so let's let's jump into that. 
Okay, so an interesting question here. It's great to see your emphasis on GUO. Our company also likes to evaluate exposure at that level. Uh, because M&A act activity is always ongoing, in your mind, who in the organization should be responsible for maintaining the GUO relationship slash customer master data management? Finance credit or sales or a separate function? Yeah, I think this is a this is an interesting question. I think what I've seen increasingly is is companies who are doing this really well um, have a you know a, a master data strategy to help manage this because because the reality is the um, ability to track changes in corporate hierarchies you know doesn't just impact one portion of the organization right uh, it, it has a you, know, you, you kind of want that view of uh, the corporate hierarchy to be visible, you know, in the ERP system, in your CRM, et, et cetera. So um, I kind of see that as a, as a master data task. Um, but I think to the extent that, you know, not every company has that kind of structured central master data organization, um, it, it, it just be, kind of becomes around consensus and, and having a, uh, an agreed process for for handling that. Um, I mean, I think that's where where having a you know a, a, a good partner that's kind of helping stay on top of that M and A activity and the like um, can be really valuable. Um, but as long as you you kind of all have an agreed process for how is that data being updated, where is it being updated, you know, how does that flow down into other systems, et cetera. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't know that there's uh, inherently a, a you know a, a right or wrong way to do it. Um, you know, other than I've I've kind of seen you know, customer master data uh, functions you know becoming increasingly prevalent, and that obviously has has uh, in, in my mind you know that that goes the the other direction as well in terms of vendor master data. You know, to the extent that you have the same companies that you're buying from and are and are selling to. Um, there's no reason to, to repeat the effort and have customer and vendor master files, you know, totally siloed. You know, you, you know, don't don't uh, don't do the same the same research twice. Okay. Okay. Um, another good question: How do you give credit limits to companies with no financial data and no payment experience? So the way that we've tackled this is is kind of to that that qualitative data point. Um, essentially what we found was that with um, with our customers, what, what they were spending a lot of time doing is that even if we didn't, and this was a couple of years back, even if we didn't have financials, you know, there was a lot of information in our data set that was useful as a, you know, a, a proxy and, and, and to help drive a, you know, a kind of manual decision around um, a, a customer's Creditworthiness, and so we we basically went and did some analysis with with one of our partners, a, a company called Mode Finance, who's a, a an ESMA credit rating agency, um, to say, okay, let's let's look at all of the companies um, that don't have financials and the data that's available, um, and let's do some basically backwards assessment in relation to the companies that do have financials and see what data elements you know, are most indicative of financial performance that we hold, right? So like one of the biggest things there is is leveraging those ownership structures that we talked about, right? In terms of saying, well, if we know how one of their subsidiaries or, you know, their parent company is performing, you know, that can be a, a really good way to, to assess risk. Um, but other factors as well, like what's the experience of the, um, of the management team or, um, you know, how are companies more broadly in this industry performing and the like, um, you know, that can all kind of help drive that as well. Um, so it's, yeah, I think it's, it's kind of an innovative way to approach it. Um, and, and maybe what I would uh, also offer is um, we have uh, a whole white paper on that as well as a whole bunch of documentation for the, the back testing and analysis we did. Um, so to the extent you're, you're interested in that, I'd, I'd certainly be, be happy to share if you want to you know, drop me an email. Okay. Any further questions coming through?
Okay. So and Beth had um, had mentioned to me that that we do have a you know recording of the webinar that that we'll be able to to share around. Um, yeah, as I said, you know, please feel free to to drop me an email for any kind of more more detailed or or confidential questions, um, or just in general, if if you'd like to get in touch with Bureau Van Dyke. Um, we do have a, a very simple kind of global email, bbd at bbdinfo.com, that you can reach out to um, to kind of get in touch with your, your local contact. Um, oh, looks like there's maybe one more question that just came in. Okay, so um, it's a question kind of clarifying what, what qualitative data means, basically saying if we don't have um, financials or previous payment experiences um, or you know, data providers with this sort of information, does it mean asking for an investigation or sharing you know, info um, through counterparty networks? Um, so I guess to clarify is, is Kind of what we're doing in terms of gathering information is, is, you know, basically going all the way down to you know local registry documents in in each country, right? And those registry documents, while they you know don't always contain you know full financial statements or you know don't have you know you know trade payment data and the like, they do often contain some you know some other information on the company like ownership, um, who the directors are, you know, who the, who the investors are in the company, you know, when the company was, was first registered, the industry, you know, what they do, et cetera. Um, and it's sort of those other data elements that kind of when combined, you know, across 300 million companies sort of starts letting us put, you know, I kind of always use a, a puzzle analogy, so it's letting us put the puzzle together that even if we don't have you know, the one puzzle piece, which is the financial statement, or the one puzzle piece, which is the trade payment data, when we start putting other things around it, we can kind of say, okay, here's the, the shape of that puzzle piece, at, at least. Um, so, so that's kind of the analogy I often use. Um, but again, maybe maybe to, to, I'm not sure if I'm totally answering exactly what, what you're asking, so maybe this is a, a question to, to elaborate on um, offline. Um, Yeah, and, and, and I guess the other clarifying point is, well, yeah, I think it's maybe following up offline to, to clarify there. Um, okay, and it looks like there are maybe a, a few other questions coming in that I think would be, yeah, maybe worth going into in more detail, specifically how our, our data, you know, uh, gets handled in, in specific countries. Um, so I'll, I'll be happy to follow up on those offline. Um, Beth, anything else from from your side before we we wrap up this this session? Um, I do not see any questions on my side. Okay, perfect. Um, well, yeah, thank you everyone for for your time and attention today. Uh, hopefully, this was this was useful. Uh, and for for those of you whose whose questions I didn't answer. Um, in the webinar, um, I'll, I'll certainly look to, to connect with you um, via email to, um, to further answer your, um, your questions. Well, thank you everyone for your participation and thank you, David. If you'd like more information on ICTF's upcoming events, including our Global Credit Professional Symposium in Chicago from April 14th to the 16th, or our International Credit Professional Symposium in Krakow, Poland from May 12th through the 14th, please visit our calendar at www.ictfworld.org. Also, we have our RGCP and CGCE online courses which start February 4th. The webinar has ended. You may now disconnect.